We've been working our way passage by passage through the book of 1 Peter. And in this section of the letter, Peter is telling believers that as citizens of the kingdom of God, we should live holy and peaceable lives. We're not to be troublemakers or agitators, but to be subject to those in authority. And that brings us now to a controversial and often misunderstood passage, I think, where Peter says that believing wives are to be subject to their husbands, since that idea is jarring to modern ears and since it is so frequently mischaracterized and misunderstood, I plan to take two weeks, Lord willing, to go through this passage. <clears throat> so this week, I want to explore just what Peter means by submitting to husbands. What does that mean? And then, in light of that, examine the frequent claim that biblical teaching is somehow oppressive to women. It's a, something we are hearing more and more. I want to address that. Then, Lord willing, next week, I will preach through verses 1 through 7 as I usually do. So today we'll focus just on the first few words, seeking to understand what Peter means when he says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands. The word likewise connects these instructions to his earlier teaching about government and, and masters. <clears throat> Remember, in those cases, Peter is calling for those who are free in Christ to voluntarily submit to earthly authorities as an aspect of their love for and obedience to God. And this command is given in the same way. He's addressing Christian women who are free in Christ and citizens of the kingdom of God, and he is telling them to entrust themselves to God's faithfulness in their relationships with their husbands. And so the social structure that is in view here is marriage. So we, we've looked at relation to government, relation to work, it's relationships within marriage. And so this is an instruction for wives, not for women in general. Peter says wives are to be subject to their own husbands. So the command is designed to function in an already intimate relationship, a relationship which God created as an illustration of the gospel to the world. Speaking of marriage in Ephesians 5, 31 through 33, the Apostle Paul says this, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The institution of marriage is unique. Unlike government, which God only institutes after the fall, or slavery, which God never instituted, marriage was part of the original good creation. To be a believing wife or a believing husband is to have a profound ministry. Each spouse has responsibilities to the other and to their family that nobody else can fulfill. And so godly submission is part of God's design for marriage as something bigger than just the relationship between the man and the woman who are involved. Marriage is bigger than just those two. So what then does it mean for a wife to be subject to her husband? It's not the kind of language people like to hear these days. <clears throat> well, I think it's easier to start with what it does not mean first. And there are seven aspects that I want to look at this morning um, that submitting doesn't mean. And the first is, submitting does not mean that she's unequal to or less than her husband. A voluntary act of submission does not mean that the one who is submissive is unequal. And we can see this most clearly in Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is God. The Son is equal to the Father in all of his divine attributes. <clears throat> 
And yet, Jesus willingly submits as the divine son to the Father in bringing about the plan of salvation. But Jesus isn't less than the Father. They're both God equally. And so when he voluntarily submits to the Father, he doesn't become less. And in the same way, wives are equal to their husbands in every way. And her submission, properly understood, does not diminish her in any way in terms of equal standing, dignity, or value. Just like Jesus, the submission Peter is talking about is concerning a role and not as a person. She's not submitting because she is, as a person, something less. She's taking a submissive role as an equal. The Bible clearly establishes the equality of men and women. In fact, one of the very first claims that the Bible makes is that the dignity and value of both men and women are established in that they are both created in the image of God. Genesis 1.27 says, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. It is difficult to imagine a more powerful statement of equality of the sexes than that statement. And so far as I'm aware... It stands utterly alone and utterly unique among any other ancient view of women. It's radical in terms of the ancient world. There is no higher dignity than to be made in the image of God himself. That means that women have the same inherent value as men and they get it from the same source that men get it from. And the implications of that alone are massive and powerful. But the Bible also presents women as equally forgiven, equally adopted, and equally heirs of the kingdom of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Galatians 3, 27 through 29 says this, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Paul is not denying that there, that there are differences between men and women, or that they even have distinct God-given roles. The fact that they do is made plain frequently in the scripture. But what he says here is that women are equal participants in the grace of God and in the coming kingdom. Those are radical claims for the equality of women. Peter is just as clear about this a few verses later in verse 7 when he reminds husbands, wives are heirs with you of the grace of life. You're the same in this respect. And so the Bible is clear and consistent that men and women are equal. Therefore, Peter's command for the wife to submit, for the believing wife to submit to her husband, must be understood in a way that is consistent with the full expression of her equal personhood. It can't be different than that. Number two, submitting does not mean that she's a servant. That's not the way in which she's called to submit. Servants submit to their masters, but that's not the way that the wife is called to submit. Before sin sin entered the world, Eve was created as a wife, as a helper, as a partner. Genesis 2.18 records this. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So she is not a helper who simply takes orders like a servant. She is fit for him. She is matched to him. The Hebrew that's being translated here emphasizes that she is just like him. They work together. They fit together. The command to be fruitful, to multiply, and to go fill the earth was given to them both. I mean, clearly Adam couldn't do that on his own. 
Next, submitting doesn't mean that she's treated like a child. In Exodus 20, God says we are to honor our father and our mother. Both hold an elevated position. Both are owed respect and both are owed honor. And he doesn't differentiate there. A wife is her husband's equal in honor. She's his partner. And as we listen to the description biblically of what an excellent wife is from Proverbs 31, it becomes very clear quickly that she's not like a child. She's a partner to her husband. Verse 11, the heart of her husband trusts in her. Verse 13, she seeks wax and wool and flax and works willingly with her hands. She's like the ships of a merchant. She brings her food from afar. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. 18, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchants. 27, she looks well to the ways of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Submitting also does not mean agreeing with everything that your, her husband thinks or says. <clears throat> the Bible never presents godly submission as agreeing with everything that her husband thinks or says. Even this passage we're looking at this morning proves that because the wives that Peter is addressing are Christians, and yet their husbands are not Christians. And so it's difficult to imagine an area of disagreement more fundamental or more important since our faith influences how we think about everything else. So Peter is calling these wives to submit to their husbands as believers, as an aspect of their faith personally, which shows that he has no expectation that she must agree with him on everything. In fact, the entire basis of this is that she does not, in fact, agree with him on the most important thing you could consider. In 1 Samuel 25, Abigail was a blessing to her husband Nabal through independent thinking and initiative, which saved his life and his property, by the way. Queen Esther wisely and bravely interceded with her husband, King Ahasuerus, to change his mind, which led to her people being saved. So there's no biblical expectation that submission means you've got to agree in everything. Submitting does not mean checking her brain at the door or her identity at the door. Godly submission, properly understood, is not acquiescence. A godly wife can and should raise objections and concerns to her husband. She should ask questions and be involved with the direction of the household. I mean, she should have her own interests and her own insights within the context appropriately of the marriage. A godly marriage is filled with fellowship and a mutual seeking of God's will as the husband and wife complement one another. And so even in a marriage that's unequally yoked, meaning one of the partners doesn't believe, the expectation is respect, not that the wife has no voice at all in the relationship. We don't see that anywhere in the Scripture. We'll look at what Peter means when he says that she's to hold her speech more closely next week. But the pattern in the Bible is vital engagement of wives in the pursuit of their calling. The disciples of Jesus included many women, some of whom we know for a fact were married. Luke 8, 1 through 3 says, soon afterward, he went through all the cities and villages, proclaiming and bringing good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. <clears throat> and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager. And Susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means. Jesus encouraged women to learn and to think. 
In Luke 10, he tells Martha that her sister Mary is doing the right thing by choosing to study rather than do housework. The Apostle John even addressed his second letter to a prominent woman in the church. One of the New Testament letters is written to a woman by an apostle. So we don't know for sure how many of the women around Jesus were married, but several women were prominent in the early church in their own right. Women were in the room praying when the Spirit came at Pentecost. Tabitha was said to be filled with good works. John's mother, Mary, hosted many meetings. Lydia and Chloe were well known among all, the, all of the leaders of the church. Apollos was a powerful preacher, one of the most powerful preachers in the early church, a man named Apollos, but both Aquila and Priscilla took him aside and corrected his doctrine. Paul mentions many women in Romans 16 that he greets. He recognizes Phoebe as a deacon in the church. And listen to what he says about the women with him in Philippians 4, 2 and 3. I entreat Eudea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, listen, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers, the rest of my fellow workers, whose names are written in the book of life. Most powerfully, though, at least to me, is that God brought the Savior into the world not through a husband, but through a wife and a mother. It is women who deliver new life into the world. And the bearer of the one who would bring eternal life was a faithful woman. Submitting doesn't mean putting her husband ahead of Jesus. Peter says, believing wives are to be subject to their husbands, even if those husbands are not following the word. He does not, however, say that they are to follow their unbelieving husbands into sin. Just as we do not let the government or our bosses or anyone else lead us into rebellion against God, neither should wives allow their husbands to do that. There are times when these two commands of God seem to be at tension with one another. <clears throat> Believing wives are commanded to be holy and to follow Christ. They're also commanded to be subject to their husbands. Well, if the two conflict, she's to follow Jesus. That is clear. The command to submit to the husband is secondary to the command to submit to God. And that's clear when we compare the reasons for the two. Appropriate submission to the husband will flow from submission to God. But if you reverse the order, that the same thing isn't necessarily the case. And so one is dependent upon the other, and it shows which one is primary. Because if you're faithful in submitting to God, you will submit appropriately within the marriage relationship. And there won't be any exception if you've completely blindly submit to your husband, it may force you to not be submissive to God, which shows that the submission to Christ is primary. Does that make sense? One is dependent on the other. But here's the thing. Wifely submission, then, is not a mechanical duty. You know, we don't want to be like Pharisees, just pulling the law out of its context. This command isn't mechanical. It's an aspect of of godly submission to Christ. A husband is responsible for his own sin. And although she is not to disrespect him, neither should she follow him in sinning. In Acts chapter 5, a man named Ananias sold property and lied about how much money he had donated to the church from, from that, that sale. And when he lied, God took his life in judgment. And then Acts 5, 7 through 10 records what happened next. After an interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, 
tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. She is judged for submitting to her husband's sinful plan in defiance of God. All believers are called to always put God first in every situation. Finally, submitting does not mean accepting neglect or abuse. Abuse is always condemned in the Bible. And to use a holy covenant like marriage for sinful purposes and abusive purposes is pure evil and violates the entire spirit of the teaching of the Bible. Do not be deceived. God will not be mocked. These men who manipulate their wives' faithfulness to her marriage vows to abuse her will answer for that. No person, and certainly no pastor, should ever tell an abuse victim that it's God's will for them to remain in an abusive situation. God's law, the law, protected wives to ensure that their basic needs were met in all sorts of situations. And they, For example, in Exodus 21.10 says, of a husband. If he takes another wife to himself, he shall not diminish her food, her clothing, or her marital rights. The context of the submission passages assumes that there is a marriage relationship in place. 1 Timothy chapter 5 makes it clear that one who neglects and thus by implication abuses their family is worse than an unbeliever. So I, we don't have time this morning to get into all the details here. But abuse is an extreme form of spousal abandonment under the law. And I think that carries over into the New Testament teaching. But we don't have time to, I don't have time to make that case for you this morning. But I will say it is clear that submission does not mean accepting abuse ever. We've looked at several things that Peter does not mean. When he says a wife is to be subject to her husband, it doesn't mean she's unequal to or less than her husband. It doesn't mean that she's a servant. It doesn't mean she should be treated like a child. It doesn't mean she agrees with everything her husband thinks or says. It doesn't mean checking her brain or her identity at the door. And it doesn't mean putting her husband before Jesus. And it doesn't mean accepting neglect or abuse. To understand what it does mean, we have to begin with the recognition that submission is an aspect that every Christian is called to. It's part of every Christian's life. The Bible says that we are all to submit to God. We're all to submit to the teaching of the apostles. We're to submit to the pastors and elders of the church. We're to submit to the government. We're to submit to those who direct our work. And in fact, in Ephesians 5.21, Paul says... Believers are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So the whole Christian life is about trusting God and submitting. So when we hear that believing wives are to be subject to their own husbands, that just means that they're to live as believers, imitating Jesus within the roles that God has placed them and established for marriage. We all have God-given roles, whether that's at work, in community, and there are roles in the family that God has called us to. I recently met two brothers who worked in a small family business. One of the brothers was the president of the company, and the other brother worked in the warehouse and made sure orders were being shipped and things like that. Now, both of these brothers own 50% of the company. They were equal partners. They were both owners, but they had different roles. And one of them, though equal, submitted to the leadership of the other because that was what was best for the business. And that's the kind of picture we have in marriage. It's a partnership of equals. And so women are simply called to live out the role that they have in a godly way. 
God is the one who created marriage, and God is the one who created the family. And he gets to choose how he sets it up. And God appointed the husband as the head of the household. The scripture is clear on that. Why he did it, he doesn't tell us. We can speculate, but it's clear that that's what he has done. It is ultimately the husband that God holds accountable for how the family is managed and how it functions in, 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 a, in a married relationship. The wife is called to help him and voluntarily yield to him in those matters, recognizing that he is the one who will give an account to God for how he's managed his household. Whether a believer or not, the husband is going to be the one who will stand before God and give an account. Peter's saying that even if the husbands are not believers, wives are to trust God and live in fulfillment of their calling as wives. To do her part, not because her husband is worthy, but because Jesus is worthy. We are all called to be faithful in the roles that God has given us. And when a woman voluntarily enters into marriage, she's voluntarily entering into that role. And we have to be very careful, because I know, I know this sounds difficult for people, but we have to be very careful within the church not to judge based upon what the world values, as though that's a demeaning thing or less than, because God will reward his servants appropriately. And as with many things, God turns the wisdom of the world upside down. Godly submission turns out to be an expression of freedom. The strife and struggle between the sexes is the result of sin. Sin brought several destructive consequences and several destructive impulses that enslaved us to it. And one of those was strife in relationships between men and women. We see this very clearly as a result of sin coming into the world in Genesis 3.16. And the NET translation makes the meaning even more clear, the meaning of the Hebrew more clear than the ESV. So I'm showing you that. And this is what Genesis 3.16 says. This is after the fall. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your labor pains. With pain you will give birth to children. You will want to control your husband, but he will dominate you. The man and the woman were created for a loving partnership. But because of sin, they would each struggle to assert themselves against the other. The woman would no longer be fulfilled in her role as a, as a partner. And the man would be drawn to abuse his headship. That's the result of sin. That's the corruption that sin brought to this institution God created. In both cases, for the man and for the woman... A sacrificial love of God and for one another has been displaced with a love for one's self. And we're all born with selfishness and sin in our heart. That's the result. And we have no power to change it. We can't change, we can't fix our sin problem because we are our sin problem. And the result is that all of us have lived lives of rebellion against God and against every other authority that he has placed above us. But there will come a time when we will be judged according to him and he will judge in righteousness. And if we are judged based upon our lives, if we're judged on the basis of our deeds and our words and our thoughts, every one of us will be condemned to an eternal separation from God and from his restored creation. What corrupted the creation? Sin. So if we're insistent on remaining in our sin, we can't be part of the new creation. So there will come a day where we will stand before him and give an account, and if we're judged on our lives, we are without hope. We'll be sent to hell. But in his mercy, God made salvation possible, And accomplished it through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus was fully God, come down from heaven, yet fully human, born of a woman. Being one of us, he could serve as another Adam, another representative of humanity. He was one of us. 
but being divine, he could pay the full price for the sins of all of mankind. He alone could do that. He lived a perfect life and then they killed him. He was offered up as a sacrifice for the sins of all those who would put their trust in him and repent and believe on him as their righteousness. So that when the day comes and we're judged, you say, yeah, if it's about me, I have no hope. But Jesus speaks for me. His blood speaks for me. He died in our place, but then three days later, he rose from the dead. And this proved that the price was paid. Sin and death had been defeated. God's justice had been satisfied. And that means that all who put their faith in him are now free from the curse of sin. And what sin brings into the world were new creations with a new heart, and we're no longer enslaved to those selfish desires that once enslaved us. We're tempted by them, but we don't have to live that way anymore. And godly submission is an aspect of God restoring the harmony of the creation. Do you see? It's an act of freedom to voluntarily submit because of our trust and confidence in God, whether it's the government or a wife, the husband, whatever, is a tremendous act of freedom. It's a rolling back of one of the consequences of the curse that sin brought. A believing husband putting his wife's interest ahead of his and a believing wife submitting to his leadership is to live now in the reality that the curse has been broken. It is to live as those already participating in the kingdom and trusting in God to bring its final consummation to bear. I know that there are many people today who find this outdated and offensive. And some professed Christians play interpretive games so that they can deny what God clearly says about this. Other people, don't; they just reject the Bible altogether. Well, if that's what it says, it's wrong outdated. People who see only through the eyes of the flesh cannot understand how submission is freedom or how weakness is power. They tell us that we have to throw off the shackles of distinct gender roles, that we are in a fierce battle for the liberation of women. They say that biblical teaching is oppressive to women and, and the new freedoms that they've gained through the sexual revolution. Well, what about that? I mean, as believers, we, we agree that all people are equally valuable. All people have inherent dignity. We agree that we must especially protect the marginalized, the weak, the poor, and the vulnerable. We agree that we have a responsibility to oppose oppression and injustice. We agree some things are right and some things are wrong. And we should use what influence we have appropriately to change the things that are wrong. We agree with all of that. Where do those values come from? Where does that come from? Because those values are foreign to the Greek, Roman, and Eastern cultures that predated Christianity. The Bible doesn't oppose those values. It is the foundation for them. Ironically, progressivism and radical feminism are themselves dependent upon them. The core, those core values come from the Bible. And they will not long survive in a culture that rejects the truth that they are built on. So in trying to go beyond Scripture, they're literally cutting off the branch that they're sitting on. Scholar Paul Achtemeyer summarized the prevalent view in Roman society at the time Peter was writing. 
He says, dominant among the elite was the notion that the woman was by nature inferior to the man because she lacked the capacity for reason that the male had. She was ruled rather by her emotions and was as a result given to poor judgment, immorality, intemperance, wickedness, avarice. She was untrustworthy, contentious, and as a result it was her place to obey. That was the way it was. Submission in Greco-Roman society was not voluntary. It was not functional. The idea that marriage should even be consensual or that women were even capable of making their own decisions was considered laughable. The Greek philosopher Plutarch, who was alive when 1 Peter was written, said this, A wife should not acquire her own friends, but should make her husband's friends her own. The gods are the first and most significant friends. For this reason, it's proper for a wife to recognize only those gods whom her husband worships and to shut the door to superstitious cults and strange superstitions. Can't have your own friends, can't think for yourself. Peter says, be yourself and be respectful. Plutarch says, don't think for yourself. Do you see the, the radical difference here? Far from oppressive, the Bible has been by far the most important force for the advancement of women in human history. The values, the values that lead to even a recognition that women should be recognized with equal dignity come from the Bible. The Bible resoundingly exalts women above cultures that distort, degrade, and debase them. Classical scholar Tom Holland, who is not a Christian, says this about the impact of biblical teaching on sexual relations in the Roman Empire. It was not just Venus who had been banished. So too had the gods fetid for their rapes. A sexual order rooted in the assumption that any man in a position of power had the right to exploit his inferiors, to use the orifices of a slave or a prostitute to relieve his needs, much as he might use a urinal, had been ended. Paul's insistence that the body of every human being was a holy vessel had triumphed. Instincts taken for granted by the Romans had been recast as sin. Sinful cultures do not easily change. And the remnants of those oppressive pagan views about women remained influential. Even in the history of the church, it is not hard to find leaders in the church writing horrible things about women. And it's good when those sinful traditions are overcome and overturned. But the true liberation of women has come from the light of the gospel, not despite it. Christian influence has elevated the status of women to a height unprecedented in any other culture. To see this, just compare the treatment of women today in countries whose laws and cultures have been shaped by Christianity with those who were shaped by other worldviews. Are women better off? Do they have better access to education or better access to opportunities in Buddhist cultures, Hindu cultures, or Islamic cultures than they have in Christian cultures? Young women in Afghanistan are being arrested and killed for learning to read. In Saudi Arabia, women can be arrested for speaking to any man who's not related to them in public. UNICEF estimates that at least 200 million girls in 31 countries, including Indonesia, Iraq, Yemen, Egypt, and 26 other African nations, have been involuntarily subjected to some form of female genital mutilation. The chains of female oppression are heaviest where the light of the gospel is dimmest. The Bible is not oppressive to women. Yes, in certain ways, women are better off now than in the past. Traditionalism is not the same thing as being biblical. Many traditional views are not biblical. Many of the key freedoms that secularism claims for women have also only recently become available to most men. 
And the barriers to those freedoms weren't biblical. They were primarily cultural. You know, it's easy for us to see the sin in progressive ideology. Well, there's plenty of sin in traditional ideology as well. And so I'm not here to defend every traditional viewpoint. I don't care about traditional marriage. I care about what the Bible says. We acknowledge that there have been and still are areas where society wrongly denies women the honor that God created them to have. But where the Bible does speak, we speak unashamedly and declare that godly submission of wives, when properly understood, will result in the greatest blessing both for wives and for society. Because that's what God's word says. And radical ideologies whose aim is the deconstruction of any role distinctions between men and women do not ultimately elevate the dignity and status of women. Instead, what they do is deny women the unique glory and honor that God created for them to have. You know, women face more exploitation and abuse today than they ever have. Violence against women is increasing drastically in our country and around the world. Women are being trafficked in staggering numbers. But on the news, we get to hear about what some celebrity did. We don't hear about this. We have unleashed an unprecedented tsunami of images and messages that objectify and degrade women. We are awash in pornography. Even mainstream advertisement and entertainment is flooded with indecency. Is that empowering for women? Is that that helpful to the way that young men think about women? Or young women think about themselves? Does this create a culture of honor for women? No. It's of the flesh, and it will inevitably lead to more oppression and more violence and worse lives for women. Because sin can only enslave us. It's only the truth that can set us free. So being a champion of uncommitted sex, murdering unborn children, and the destruction of families does not leave women uplifted. It leaves them further exposed And often, the responsibility to manage the emotional and psychological scars of that fall on those women. The progressive answer is to remove any sensitivity to sin. Well, the problem is, we just got to get rid of this whole idea of sin. But just in the same way that our sensitivity to pain protects our bodies from further damage, sensitivity in our consciences, consciences protect us from eternal damnation. So it's not a good thing to numb yourself to the sin, to see this filth and just think, well, that's the way it is. It's not a good thing. The Bible is not oppressive to women. The call for a Christian wife to submit to her husband doesn't reduce her in any way. It actually elevates her. It redirects our attention from the wisdom of the world and the categories and hierarchies that the world works with and shifts it to the eternal promise that God has made to his beloved daughters that by faith they will be with Christ in glory. So the real question with all of this is, do we trust God's word? Do we trust him? Does he keep his promises? You know, Peter came to the Lord and said, Lord, we've given up everything for you. What are we going to get? Remember? So when we're asked to do something, and I understand how this sounds, especially in the way it's been misused, we say, well, what am I going to get? What does he promise? What does he promise to the Christian wife? Promise an eternity of glory with him. Promise blessings that are beyond imagination. 
And he promises to reward in proportion to our faithfulness. Those who do so will not be disappointed. Amen? Thank you.